give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Good morning. Welcome to Christchurch Hamel this morning. Those words there are from Psalm 118. They are celebrating the fact that the king has saved his people and has come into his kingdom. We know that king as King Jesus, so let's praise him in prayer now. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you are good. Thank you that you do not change, that we can trust in your goodness every day. We praise you that your love endures forever, and we see that all the more clearly in the Lord Jesus Christ. So this morning, as we gather together, help us to praise him, we pray. Amen. Great, well, we're going to sing our first song this morning. If you need lyrics, there are uh, lyric QR codes around the room. There's one in front of the musicians. Uh, or there are printed lyrics over there, or you can look at the screen. But we're going to sing our first song this morning, which is Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of Creation. So please stand and sing as the music starts. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Christchurch Hemel this morning. Uh, my name is Dave. I'm one of the pastors here of the church. It is great to have you uh, with us, whether this is your first time or your hundredth time or even more than that. It's good to have you here with us. As I've mentioned already, uh, the lyrics are all available on the screen, but if you need to see them a bit closer, there are printouts. There are also uh, a website you can go to by scanning the QR codes in the room to get them on your phone. We are gathering again this evening to pray and to hear God's words, 
at 6 p.m. in the Willow Room down there. If you consider yourself part of the church family, I would strongly encourage you to come and join us because prayer is vital to the life of church. So if you can come and join us, 6 p.m. starts down in the Willow Room this evening. We're also gathering on Good Friday, which is this coming Friday, gathering to think over uh, what happened on that first Good Friday. Why do we call it Good We're going to be meeting together at 3 p.m. 3 p.m. here in the hall, right here. So come and join us for that. And then on Easter Sunday, which is next Sunday evening, uh, Sunday morning, we're going to be celebrating the resurrection together, uh, starting at 10:30. You'd be very welcome to join us for that. And if that's not good enough, we're having lunch afterwards as well. So bring your lunch with you next Sunday morning and we'll be having lunch together, and why not bring something to share as well? That'd be great, to celebrate the resurrection together as a family, having a family lunch with each other. Great. Well, this morning I need some help, and I'm looking at the children in particular, because I need some help to figure out why some things have been written. Why have some things been written? Can anyone help me? Uh, Here's my first one. I found this earlier, I thought I'd collect it. Uh, I don't think it's being used for anything. Can anyone tell me, what, what do you think this, this is all about? Uh, I found it on a sign. I found it on a bench. It looks quite nice. So I might put it up on my wall. Any ideas? What's this sign trying to tell me to do? <gasps> Olivia. It says wet paint. Well, why might that be on something? Any ideas? Oh, Toby. I'll just not touch it in case you get paint on you. You mean... I took it off a bench, and if someone sat on the bench, they might end up with a bit of a colourful bottom. Oh, sorry about that. Well, not a good idea. Great. Well, that's written for that reason. Be careful. Don't touch it. Stay off. Keep your clothes paint-free. Great. Well, here's another one I found. Here's another one I found. Anyone tell me, what does this sign say? What does this sign say? Stop. 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 What is this sign? What do you think it's for? What's it meant to do? Let's down. Make people stop. Great. That's what it's meant to do. Brilliant. Maybe it's telling cars. Maybe it's telling people. It's saying, be safe. Stop. Put that one there. Here's something else I found with something written on it. Where is it? Here. Can someone come up and read for me? Have a read of this and tell me what it's saying on here. What, what kind of thing is it saying? Who wants to read this for me? Oh. Go on, Joshua. You don't need to read absolutely everything on it. You can tell me what kind of thing is it saying. Yeah, what, what's, it, what's it trying to tell us to do? So these are wild seeds you can plant in your garden, and it tells you when best to plant them. If I planted them, say if I planted a bulb in a a pot in October, I'm not going to get much out of that, am I? But this says if you sow them in March to August, you might attract bumblebees and other animals to your garden. That sounds good. So the instructions are here to tell me how best to plant these flowers. Ah, So the signs tell me different things. They've got a reason for being written. These seeds have an instruction that tell me the reason for why they're here. I wonder if the Bible says similar. Can you turn with me in your Bible to John chapter 20, verses 30 to 31? Here we go. It's up on the screen. Page 1090. Now, over Easter, we're going to be looking at John. So it's useful to know why has John written his gospel? Now, if you found it, if you're too small to see, you can still have your parent point it to you. But it's useful to have a look at the Bible, see what I'm saying? So John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. And I'm going to ask you, after I've read it, why did John write his book? Okay, I'm going to ask you, after I've read it, why did John write his book? Are you ready? Little number 
30 says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of disciples which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Okay, can anyone see why did John write his book? Go on, Olivia. Great, so you can see that Jesus is the Messiah and that you can believe in him. Brilliant. That means that each one of us can read John's book. You can read it in the Bible or you can read just John's book on its own. We've got some copies over there if you haven't got one already. And you can read it and believe in who Jesus is. That is the point. That is why John has written it. That's what we're going to do over Easter for these next couple of weeks uh, in Sunday Club. And in the sermons, we're going to be looking at John's gospel to see what John is saying so that we can believe in Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah. Now, if you've never read John's gospel before, there are free copies of this for you to take home on the table over there. So feel free to take one or join us over these next uh, few mornings. Well, Good Friday and Easter Sunday as well as we look at John's gospel together. But shall I pray? And we'll pray and give thanks so we can do that. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that John wrote his book so that we can learn about Jesus and believe in him. Help us to do that in Sunday Club and in the sermons and with our parents at home as well. Amen. Well, the good news of the gospel is that God loved the world and so he sent his son into the world to die for the sake of us. We're going to sing those famous words from John 3.16 now in our next song, God so loved. So please stand and sing when the music starts.
And if you could turn in your Bibles to Psalm 49. Psalm 49, that's page 571 of the Red Church Bibles. We're going to use this psalm to help us pray. And this is a psalm that speaks to all people about the certainty of where the future is going. So I'm going to read the passage for us, and then we're going to use it to help us pray. So, Psalm 49. For the director of music of the sons of Korah, a psalm. Hear this, you, all you peoples. Listen, all who live in this world, both high, low and high, rich and poor alike. My mouth will speak words of wisdom. The meditation of my heart will give you understanding. I will turn my ear to a proverb. With the harp, I will expound my riddle. Why should I fear when evil days come, when wicked deceivers surround me, those who trust in their wealth and boast of their great riches? No one can redeem the life of another or give to God a ransom for them. The ransom for a life is costly. No payment is ever enough so that they should live on forever and not see decay. For all can see that the wise die, that the foolish and the senseless also perish, leaving their wealth to others. Their tombs will remain their houses forever, their dwellings for endless generations, though they had named lands after themselves. People, despite their wealth, do not endure. They are like the beasts that perish. This is the fate of those who trust in themselves and of their followers who approve their sayings. They are like sheep and are destined to die. Death will be their shepherd. But the upright will prevail over them in the morning. Their forms will decay in the grave far from their princely mansions. But God will redeem me from the realm of the dead. He will surely take me to himself. Do not be overawed when others grow rich, when the splendor of their houses increases, for they will take nothing with them when they die. Their splendor will not descend with them. Though while they live, they count themselves blessed. And people praise you when you prosper. They will join those who have gone before them who will never again see the light of life. People who have wealth but lack understanding are like the beasts that perish. We're going to use that psalm to help us pray now. And as we pray, we're also going to pray for Paulian Petrich, our mission partner who works with Wycliffe Bible Translators. And we're also going to pray for our evangelism. So let's turn to pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you humbly, acknowledging your greatness and your sovereignty over all things. In your wisdom, you have laid out a path for us, guiding us through every trial and every triumph. So as we reflect on these words here in Psalm 49, we're reminded of our fleeting life, the fleeting nature of wealth, the fleeting nature of worldly possessions. Father, would these words here guide our minds? Would you help us to set our hearts on eternal treasure, knowing that nothing on earth compares with the richness of your love and your grace? Grant us the wisdom to understand that no one can redeem themselves or others with earthly riches. Help us to remember that it's only through your mercy and your salvation that we can find true redemption and freedom from our sin. Thank you that the psalmist knows that. Thank you that we too can know 
that the future is secure in your hands and that we will live with you forever. Thank you that everything that is sad and bad will be removed. So help us to keep that truth ahead of us at all times. In times of trouble, in times of uncertainty, help us to find our refuge in you, knowing that you are our rock and our salvation. Strengthen our faith, Lord, and help us to trust in your provision and your guidance in all circumstances. We praise you that your good news of your glorious future is for all. And so we thank you for our mission partner, Paul Ian Petrich. Thank you for his desire to translate your word so that people in other lands can read it themselves. Father, we pray for his trip to Central Asia next month. Thank you that all the visas he needed have come through. And we pray it would be a productive and useful trip. Help him to have good interactions with all the local teams there, we pray. And we pray for his family as well. In particular, we pray for his father's health, as it's been in decline over these past few weeks. Father, please be with Paul Ian and his family. Strengthen his mother, Paulina, to care for him amidst her own health concerns as well. And Father, we pray for Paulian and Adina's family, his, their children as well. We pray for them as they study. We pray you would keep them trusting you. And as Easter fast approaches, we do thank you for the opportunity it provides to share the hope we have. Thank you that at the resurrection, the Lord Jesus was shown to be the promised king who has secured our future. So we pray that over this Easter time, we would be bold in sharing that hope. Help us to point you to Jesus in the way we speak, in the way we act during this time. And help us to be welcoming here at Christchurch Hemel and be courageous to invite people and friends and family and neighbours to join us. Give us the opportunities to speak and we ask for the boldness to take them too. And we praise you, Father, that you do hear our prayer and that you do answer our prayers. And so we pray all of this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, because Jesus is the risen King, we can be certain that all the promises God has made are yes and amen in him. So we're going to celebrate that in our next song, Come People of the Risen King. And as we sing this song, Sunday Club and Crash are going to begin. So please let the leaders get there first so they can sign you in and then join them after that. We're going to stand and sing, Come, People of the Risen King.
John at Christmas. We're in John 1. We're going to be rejoining John. We're leaving. Oh, you might be able to hear me now. Uh, we are, we've been in Acts for a few weeks. Am I on? I'm on. Uh, we've been in Acts for a few weeks, but we're leaving Acts and we're going back into John for Easter. Uh, we, were, we did John 1 at Christmas, so we're going to jump in at the, uh, the other end of uh, Jesus' earthly life in John and rejoining uh, John 12 this morning. And we're going to do John 12 this morning and then John 19 and 20 on Friday and Saturday in the final uh, week of Jesus' earthly life, uh, then his death and then his resurrection. And we see the events around that. Uh, but I encourage you to read the in-between. We're going to be in 12 today. We'll be in 19 on Friday. Why not read, if my maths are right, 13 to 18 uh, between now and Friday. So you're with us on Friday morning. Right, John 12, you can find at page 1079, I have got various readers prepped around the room. So Tim and Francesca and Gareth. And Gareth? Hopefully Gareth. Yeah, Gareth Chesterton, come and join me. Gareth, there you are, Gareth. Yeah, come and, come and join me. Come on, you need to be at the front for this so people can hear you, if that's all right. Um, there are, so John 12, we're going to read the whole thing. It's a longer reading, uh, but that will mean it will be a shorter talk, don't worry. Uh, we will not be here um, until tea time. Uh, what I'm, I'm going to move away from the mic so you guys can be closer to the mic. And maybe I'll go to that side. Is that all right? Yes. Lovely. Okay, so we've got, just uh, to break it up, we've got uh, a Greek and a crowd. We've got Jesus right there, and we've got uh, Judas and the crowd there <laughs> at the back. You don't have to boo, Gareth. When that <laughs> it's all right. So when, when it's your, guys, when it's your part, if you come up and speak nice and loudly towards the mic, it's fine. You don't have to be super close to it. If you speak nice and loudly towards the mic, that'll be great. I think probably Gareth, Gareth Chetton at the back there, you'll be the first one to read after me. Okay, John chapter 12. Hopefully it should work out for you listening. Um, we'll see how we get on. I'm going to read the whole chapter. So, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here, a dinner was given in Jesus' honour. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about half a litre of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth the year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For an account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. The next day, the great crowd, uh, the next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, "Hosanna! Hosanna! Hosanna. Blessed, blessed is he who comes, comes in the name of the, name of the Lord. Lord. Blessed, blessed is the King, of, the King Israel. of Israel." Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it, as it is written, "Do not be afraid, daughter Zion." See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realise that these things had been written about him, that these things had been done to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is just getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Now there were some Greeks among them who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip and told Jesus. Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, 
it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. Now my soul is, my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, This voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. The crowd spoke up. We have heard from the Lord that the Messiah will remain forever. So how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? Then Jesus told them, You are going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in the dark does not know where they are going. Believe in the light while you have the light, so that you may become children of the light. When he had finished speaking, Jesus left and hid himself from them. Even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, Lord, who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason they could not believe, because as Isaiah says elsewhere, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, so they can neither see with their eyes, nor understand with their hearts, nor turn, and I would heal them. Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. Yet at the same time, many even among the leaders believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear they would be put out of the synagogue. For they loved human praise more than praise from God. Then Jesus cried out, Whoever believes in me does not believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. The one who looks at me is seeing the one who sent me. I have come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. If anyone hears my words, but does not keep them, I do not judge that person. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. There is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. The very words I have spoken will condemn them at the last day. For I did not speak on my own, but the Father who sent me commanded me to say, all that I have spoken. I know that his command leads to eternal life. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. Lovely. Oh, lovely. Thank you very much, readers. Go and grab yourselves a seat. Thank you for helping us out there. Uh, we're going to look at that passage, but like I say, longer talk. Uh, so longer. Let me get the other way around. Longer reading. So shorter talk. Um, but uh, let's pray. We need God's help to understand his word. So uh, let's pray together. Father God, thank you very much for your word. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ we can see in the pages of the book of John. Please, as we look at the Lord Jesus Christ, would we have eyes to see and ears to hear who he is? Would our hearts be turned to him? Would we believe and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ? And we pray that for our good, and for his glory. Amen. So here's the question. Do you believe? Do you believe? Now, belief is a funny thing because we can use it in uh, different ways. Sometimes belief is kind of just a, a personal taste thing, a little bit like uh, this Marmite that is almost completely finished because I love it. Um, I believe that Marmite tastes great particularly on toast with some butter. I'm getting some disgusted faces around the room. But I believe, sometimes belief is, is a matter of personal taste. 
isn't it? That's, what, that's how we use it. Sometimes belief is just kind of agreement. I agree with you, fine. So I believe that you did your homework. My parents used to say to me that to me a lot, and often that belief was sadly misplaced. I believe you that you did your homework, yes. Um, but belief at its biggest is reasoned trust. Reasoned trust. That's something we put our full weight on. Yes, that makes sense. So I believe it. Now, let me, let me, let me help us understand that. I used to um, take kids on high ropes courses. You've heard, heard of a high ropes course? Looks a bit like that. Whether you've ever been on a high ropes course, maybe you look at that and your palms feel sweaty already. A high ropes course, you go uh, high and you're on ropes, and it's a course. Um, so that's what it's like. Um, they're brilliant. They're a load of fun. But the thing about a high ropes course, you can see it's high up. By the way, you can see those two people. They have harnesses on. They are harnessed up to the eyeballs. Um, the thing about a high ropes course is it's just perceived risk. You're at, actually, there's no risk whatsoever. It's more risky to walk along the pavement of a road than it is to do a high ropes course. You're in no danger. But still some people are kind of scared of doing a high ropes course. And I had to coax children when I was a, when I was a teacher. I had to coax them onto it. Believe me, it'll be fine. You'll be all right. You're safe. I could show them the harness. I could check the, I could with them check the connections, check all the different points. I could talk about the stats on safety for a high ropes course. We could check the line. I could go ahead of them. You're safe. Believe me. And we could reason that trust. They could see me do it. They could believe, see the line, and so they could go. They reasoned that they could trust me. They could trust the line. They could trust the harness. So they went. They kept their eyes open. And they went. Jesus calls for belief. John is about belief. Belief in Jesus for life. And in John chapter 12, Jesus calls for belief. Verse 36, he says this. Believe in the light. Now, Jesus is the light of the world. He calls himself in John chapter 8. Believe in the light while you have the light. So that you may become children of light. Jesus calls for belief. But what sort of belief is Jesus talking about? Is he talking about Marmite belief, personal taste? You don't believe me if you fancy it, but whatever really. Is that the sort of belief Jesus, that Jesus is calling for in John? It, or is it just kind of um, belief, yeah, just kind of acceptance, like, like my parents with my homework? Yeah, fine. Is that the sort of belief Jesus expects? Or is it high ropes belief? reasoned trust, and so putting our life in his hands. Let's join Mark chapter, John chapter 12, sorry, and see. John chapter 12, verse 1. That's where we start the story. John uh, chapter 12 starts these six days before Passover. At Passover will be when Jesus has been crucified. So we're in the last six days of his earthly life. And Passover, well, it's a massive festival. Here's what happened at Passover. Uh, Jewish people remembered how God had rescued them from Egypt. Back in the book of Exodus, he rescued them from Egypt. This amazing rescue from slavery thousands of years before. And so they met together to observe and, and, and rejoice and celebrate Passover. Well, this Passover we're going to see in the book of John is going to be an even bigger rescue. But at, in chapter 12, Jesus comes to Bethany. Can you see that? comes to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. And he goes to Lazarus and Martha's house. And he has dinner there. And then he travels into Jerusalem. Verse 12. Now Jerusalem is a city readying itself for a festival. It's like Glastonbury. You ever seen Glastonbury on TV? It would have been overcrowded, smelly, dirty. And the port would have been out and you wouldn't want to go anywhere near them. It, but, but the atmosphere was electric. There's an, an air of expectation around Jerusalem. And the chief priest of the temple would be, well, he's expecting to be the headline act on this Passover stage, the main stage. Uh, but there is only one head, headline act this Passover. It's Jesus Christ. And we can see how Jesus presents himself, who Jesus is in John chapter 12. You can see it actually straight in verse 1. Six days before Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived. What had Jesus done for Lazarus? Well, Jesus had raised him from the dead. 
Just the chapter before, chapter 11, Jesus had raised Lazarus. Lazarus had been dead for four days. He was rotting in the tomb. And Jesus had gone to Lazarus and he shouted, Lazarus, come out. Now, that's a crazy thing to do, to go to a tomb and shout a person's name, come out. But not for Jesus, because Jesus has power to do what? He has power to give life. He can give life to the dead. Jesus is the life giver. And then three times in chapter 12, John reminds us of that miracle. So verse 1, you can see Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. And then in verse 9, we see it again. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. And then in verse 17, again, now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Now, either John is getting a bit old and he's forgotten that he's told us, so he's telling the same story three times. I mean, that maybe happens to some of us uh, at various points. We keep telling the same story and over and over again. Maybe that's what's going on, on with John. Well, probably not actually. He's trying to make a point, telling us over and over again, in amongst the talk of death, and we will see talk of death, where does life come? Who is the life giver? Well, it's Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus is the one who raised Lazarus. He is the one who can raise the dead. He is the one who gives life. He is the one who gives. Right at the end of our chapter, verse 50, Jesus says, I know his command leads to eternal life. Jesus gives eternal life to you and me. That's who he is. That's what he does. He's the life giver. What else does, does Jesus show us about himself here in John chapter 12 that, that we might believe? Where well, he shows us, John shows us, he, he records Jesus coming into Jerusalem. Verse 12, Jesus is the rescuing king. So verse 12, Jesus heads into Jerusalem. It's quite an event. Um, verse 13, these, uh, this crowd, you can imagine the scene, they're going mad, they're, they're chanting, the people have ripped palm branches from the trees and they're shouting Hosanna, which means give salvation now. They're being whipped up to fever pitch like a, like, a, like a crowd at a football match when their team scores a winning goal in the final minute. They're going crazy. They're nuts for King Jesus because they see him as the one who can bring salvation, the king of Israel. But what they think about the king is that he's going to come and bring salvation from the Romans, freedom from the Romans. They want freedom from the Romans who are occupying. So that's why they're shouting for him. And then when Jesus emerges, what does he emerge on? Well, famously, he emerges on a young donkey. He's not on a massive war horse clad in armor with tough looking soldiers around him. He's on a colt, a young donkey. What an anticlimax. Expecting to see Jesus as a military king. Well, could Jesus not find the war horse? Is that the problem? So he had to settle with a donkey? Is that what happens? No, Jesus is riding into Jerusalem on a donkey intentionally. He did it on purpose. Verse 14, 15. Jesus found a young donkey, sat upon it. As it is written, this is Zechariah chapter 9. Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. Zechariah, hundreds of years before, wrote about God's promised forever rescuing king coming. Zechariah, hundreds of years, had prophesied that Jesus would come. In Zechariah uh, 9, 9 and 10, it says this, hopefully, any moment now, it's coming up behind me. There we go. Hundreds of years before, this is what Zechariah had said, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion, shout, daughter Jerusalem, see your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem. The battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. The Messiah would come to bring peace. As Jesus rides in on a young donkey, he's saying, I am that Messiah king. I have come to save, not from Roman occupation, but from your sin. I have come to proclaim peace. Peace that is between humanity and God. Peace that is for the whole world, to all the nations. Jesus came to bring us peace, to save. So what John shows us straight from the off in John chapter 12, that Jesus is the life-giving, rescuing king who brings peace for the whole world. 
So how's he going to show that? How's he going to prove it? Everyone around Jesus expects him to do something big, a massive display of power, God's glory to the whole world in a blaze. How do you think Jesus could show God's glory best? How would you expect Jesus to show the glory of God in in vivid technicolor to the whole world? How could he do that? Would he, uh, I don't know, get into Jerusalem and then click his fingers and fireworks go off behind him? Yes, looking good. Is that how Jesus could show God's glory? Or could he do some superhero-like display of overwhelming power in Jerusalem? Would that show God's glory? Well, that's not how Jesus says he shows God's glory. Jesus shows God's glory, but not how we think. He shows God's glory by dying in his death. Here's the thing we see over and over again in this passage. Jesus, the life-giving, rescuing king, has come to die. He's come to die. And we do see that time and again in this passage in John 12. Go back to the start of John 12. I know we're kind of moving around it a little bit. I just want to show you this story of Jesus and Mary. In chapter 12, verse 3. See what Mary did. She comes in at the dinner. She takes about half a litre of this perfume, nard. Now that's taken from a stem of a plant in India, which, um, as you can imagine, that's a long way away from um, Jerusalem where they were. But it it would be taken from this stem and kind of refined. She's got half a litre of the stuff. That's a fair old chunk of nard. Maybe she's got up to about £30,000 worth of perfume in her hands. And yet what did she do? She took all of it and she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. Now they used to use this nard to anoint bodies after they died because it was strong and it masked the stink of a decomposing body. And as she pours it on Jesus' feet, Jesus explains the significance of this. Verse 7. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. Jesus is saying, I've come to be buried. I've come to die. In fact, you can turn over and see Jesus say the same again in a different way. Verse 23. Jesus replies as the Greeks ask to see Jesus. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Can you see Jesus saying, the hour has come, what for? For the Son of Man to be glorified. How is he glorified? Well, like a grain of wheat dies. It, it, uh, if it dies, when it dies, it produces many seeds. Jesus is saying, I've come to die like a kernel of wheat. And like a kernel of wheat, when he dies, his death will produce much life. But just pause for a second. Because we can talk about Jesus' death, and we will talk about Jesus' death um, well, every Sunday. Um, we'll talk about the cross of Christ. We can talk about Jesus' death, and we can think about it kind of as a cold fact. Okay, that's something I can assent to. Jesus died, and then move on. But how does Jesus feel about his death? Is this a transaction? That happens. A cold transaction that Jesus does. Have a look and see how Jesus feels about his death. How he feels about being like this kernel of wheat that falls to the ground and dies. Look in verse 27. Now, my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason that I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. How does Jesus feel about his death there? He's troubled. And that's a really strong word. We can say Jesus was scared. He was terrified. He was petrified even by what was coming. My soul is troubled. There is depth in those words. For Jesus to be troubled, to be shaken to the core, it takes an infinite amount of suffering. At this point in his life, Jesus stood on the edge of darkness and pain and rejection, and loss, and judgment, and he knew the choice that he had to make. 
what shall I say? Shall I say, Father, save me from this hour? No. See, Jesus is making a choice. Let's not imagine, though, for one second that this was a cold equation. Jesus was scared. And it wasn't the bodily pain of the cross that troubled him. It was the spiritual reality of drinking the cup of God's wrath down to its very dregs, of experiencing the full force and weight of God's wrath at sin on him. It cost Jesus everything. We get blasé about his death. We mention it as a throwaway line, but look at his words in verse 27. My soul is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, the hour of my death. No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. If you're in any doubt that Jesus came to die, we see it in his words there. He knew exactly what he was doing. And he underlines it. Verse 30, 31. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. So Jesus even knew what kind of death he was going to die. He was going to die a death that would be lifted up in front of people. It's an Isaiah 53 death. Lifted up in front, like Isaiah said he would be. See, Jesus' death is one that he went to intentionally. Jesus' death is something that actually does something. Jesus' death isn't just an example. It's not just a picture of love. Jesus came to die to do something for you and me. What does Jesus' death achieve? Look at verse 31. It achieves this. Now is the time for judgment in this world. Jesus' death achieves judgment. Sin as exposed as Jesus is murdered by those he's created. His cross, in a sense, is judgment on this world, but that judgment is poured on Jesus. Now is the time for judgment in this world. Jesus' death achieves. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. See that at the end of verse 31. His death achieves the defeat of the devil. See, when Jesus dies, the, the devil's power is broken. When King Jesus died, he took the curse of sin and paid for it all. And that breaks Satan's power. It defeats him. He's got nothing. What does Jesus' death achieve? It achieves judgment on this world, on him. It achieves the defeat of the devil, verse 31. And it achieves, verse 32, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. What does Jesus' death achieve? It means that we can be drawn to him. Jesus' death draws all types of people to himself. Rich, poor, men, women, young, old, Jews, Samaritans, Greeks, Romans, Europeans, Asians, South Americans, even you and me. Jesus' death achieves something. And all that comes together to show what Jesus' death achieves, it achieves God's glory. Jesus' death is for the glory of God. That's what Jesus says in verse 23. saw it a few moments ago. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Jesus' death is for God's glory. How is that the case? How can someone's death bring glory to God? Well, it's because in Jesus' death, the godness of God is on display to the whole cosmos. You see, when Jesus dies, we see what God is like. Do you want to see what God is like? Well, you look at Jesus on the cross. Look at the cost he paid for you. Look at the love he displayed for you. Look at the rescue he made for you. Jesus' death is a glorious thing. It brings glory to God because as Jesus died, sin is exposed, life is given, the devil is defeated, and God draws sinful people to himself to be children of light. So what does Jesus expect as a response to that truth? He expects us to believe. That's what he calls for. Believe in the light, verse 36, while you have the light, so you may become children of light. What does Jesus expect? Does Jesus expect us, seeing him in John 12, to go, yeah, great, that's a nice message. Good. Does he expect that from us? No. No. He expects us to believe. He says it to the crowd then. He says it to us today. And what sort of belief does Jesus want? 
Is Jesus saying, this is like Marmite. Believe in me if you like, but it's fine if you don't. I don't really mind. Is that the sort of belief that Jesus is expecting? No, it's not, is it? Jesus wants reasoned trust in him. He wants us to see who he is and put our lives in his hands. And he has proved that he is worthy of that. He's the light of the world, the life-giving, rescuing king sent from God who has died for us. Do you believe? It's not a matter of personal taste. It's a matter of life and death. And it's beautiful. God himself has come in Jesus to go through darkness and death so that you can have life and light. If we just spend some time with that, we see the beauty. Do you believe? There are three different responses to Jesus in this passage. There are those who won't believe. You see them as we went through. Gareth, I, I gave Gareth the... The, uh, the not very nice task of reading of two of those who are giving him the job of the, of the baddie. The Pharisees, they don't believe in Jesus. They want to kill him. They want to arrest him and kill him. Judas, he just cares about the money. He doesn't care about Jesus. He doesn't believe. And the crowd, they're confused about Jesus. He's not what they expected. And they don't believe. What's going on with that lack of belief? Well, look at verse 37. Even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet. Lord, who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason, they could not believe. Because as Isaiah says elsewhere, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts. So they can neither see with their eyes, nor understand with their hearts, nor turn and I would heal them. What's going on? The Pharisees, Judas, the crowd... They saw all of Jesus, but they would not believe in him, and so they could not believe in him. They would not, and so they could not. But what does Jesus call them to do? Still, he calls them, believe. Believe that Jesus is the life giver, the rescuing king who brings you peace with God. Stop and look at Jesus Christ. Believe in the Lord Jesus, because not to believe in Jesus is madness. To reject and refuse him. Well, it's like walking out on a high ropes course. The high ropes course of eternity, you could say, without a harness, without a guide, in the pitch black, the wrong way. You will fall. You will die. Come and look at Jesus. Is that a word for you today? Have you up till this point refused to believe in Jesus, just not given him the time of day until today? Look at the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the life-giving one, the rescuing king who has come to save you. The more time you spend with Jesus, the more amazing you'll see that he is. But the first response, sadly, is rejection. Look at the second response, though. It's more subtle. It's not outright rejection. You see verse 42. At the same time, many even among the leaders believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear they'd be put out of the synagogue. For they loved human praise more than praise for God, praise of God. So some of them believed in Jesus, but they kept it quiet because they were scared what people would do. The problem was they loved human praise more than praise from God. And these people in, in verse 42, they're trying to love this life and have life in Jesus at the same time. Trying to have both. Love this life and have life in Jesus. But Jesus has already said where that leads you in verse 25. Anyone who loves their life will lose it. But anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If we think we can have Jesus on our terms, if we think we can have a little bit of Jesus here and there, and I'll crack on with my life, my way, the rest of the time, if we think we can have a little bit of Jesus on Sunday, and then just ignore him the rest of the time, you can just live how we like. Well, Jesus has no time for that. He has no time for that. If you think that Jesus is the truth, if you think he is God and he can save you, but you're holding back because you fear what people might think or what the impact in your life might be, if you're a, a, a Christian on Sunday, but you live nothing like it the rest of the week, can I say you're in a dangerous place? 
You've got the chance to know God that himself. You've got the chance to have eternal life, to live life to the full in Christ. But we need to put our full weight on him. We need to trust him with all of life and see the change in our lives that come. These people are missing out. We miss out when we don't put all of our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. We miss out with our lives. And these people here in verse 42 and 43, they were missing out because they loved praise from people more than praise from God. And here's the problem with that. Praise from people is skin deep. It's based on what you do. If we live our lives looking for praise from other people, it's temporary, it's passing, it's unfulfilling. And yet we do so often crave praise from people, don't we? We go out of our way to make people think well of us. We get really embarrassed if people think badly of us. We crave praise from people. But what is God's praise compared to the praise of our peers? What is God's approval of you compared to theirs? See, here's the truth. He knows you deeply. He knows your flaws and your failures. And he loves you anyway. He loves you enough for Jesus to come for you, to die for you. And praise from God, what it means, it means that you don't have to strive for acceptance from other people. You don't have to fear other people. Our lives aren't ruled by how other people think. We're either euphoric if they, if they praise us or we're crushed if they hate us. See, when we believe and we follow Christ, we have the praise of God. And so we don't need to fear people. That's the second response, though. Those who say they believe but really don't. What's the third response? Here's where we're going to finish. Third response is belief in Jesus. The Greeks start us off. Sir, we would like to see Jesus. That's like the starting point. Genuine seeking Jesus. That's where belief starts. But belief is seen mostly in this passage in Mary. We look, go back to the start, to verse 3. Mary. What did belief look like for Mary? It was devotion to the Lord. She didn't hold back. She gave Jesus her best. I want to be like Mary. Mary was devoted to Jesus. And brothers and sisters, in the light of the cross, we have got much more reason than Mary to be devoted to Jesus Christ this morning, this week. To devote our lives to him in belief and trust. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who's come to die to give us light and life. Jesus is worthy of your love, of your devotion. Jesus is worthy of your belief. You can put all your weight on him. Like those people on the high ropes course we saw at the start, you are completely safe with him as you head on to the high ropes course of eternity. So as we head into Easter week, I'd love us to, to deepen our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, to spend time with him and see his beauty and so see the reasons we can believe in him. I'd love us to spend time meditating on him. Here's a really practical way of doing that. This week, a practical way. Well, not this week, read from chapter 12. We've read that together this morning. Read chapters 13 to 18 before Friday. If you're doing our church reading plan, you should be there anyway. But if you're not, join in with us for this week. And read chapters 13 to 18, Monday to Friday. The words that Jesus spoke to his disciples just before he was arrested. I can't think of better words for us to read as we move towards the cross. Because these are the words that Jesus wants us to know. So read chapters 13 to 18 and dwell on the Lord Jesus Christ. See reasons to believe and how you can live for him. Spend time with him. See the beauty. And believe in Christ. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for the reasons to believe we can see in John 12. Thank you that Jesus is the life-giving, rescuing King who has come for the whole world. Thank you for those reasons to believe. And thank you that Jesus has come to die, that he did die. And in his death, 
he achieves our salvation. Thank you that in his death he brings you glory by putting the godness of God on display. And we pray, Father God, that seeing that, we would put our trust in Jesus. We would believe in him. And we pray that that belief would drive us to wholehearted devotion and love for Christ this week. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to uh, stand and sing as we close of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to sing a song that reminds us of the gospel. Let's stand and sing together as the music starts.
stands, Jesus says these words, Believe in the light while you have the light, so that you may become children of light. Father God, we pray that we'd hear those words of Jesus, that we would indeed be children of light, and that you would preserve us until that day when we live in the light fully and finally, singing your power to save. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.